I've been so excited to do this, this next part here with you guys. Okay, so the core problem, have one problem in mind, just one problem. And what we're going to go do is now we're going to work on creating the core product or solution. Every single product is a solution. And when you think of it in that term, um, this next part gets very, very fun. And this is, again, very opposite of what is taught in mainstream entrepreneurship. This is not necessarily going to come from your own brain. But this process I want to lead you through here will actually manufacture creativity so you actually come up with a really amazing product. Okay, <clears throat> so we're going to go dive on into this. This is... Um, this guy's awesome. Um, his name is Drew Eager. Uh, he was the CMO of Denny's and of Pizza Hut. He invented stuffed crust pizza, humana humana. Okay, amazing guy. And uh, he was uh, one of my first one-on-one -on -one mentors and uh, he, he was one of my marketing teachers. Great guy, amazing. I came back to, to my campus several years after leaving and we set up our banner there and took a picture in front of him at this like career fair that was going on. So that's him though. Um, <laughs> And uh, one day he walked on in, we were in the semester where we had nothing else to do except try to launch a legitimate business from scratch with no help. And so that was the whole semester. And you had to make as much money physically as you could, and that was like the final, okay? And if you didn't make any money, like you failed. Okay, you had to go make money. It was a really cool, uh, really cool class and semester. So what they did is they went and they divided us all up and they said, Stephen, you are in the food industry. And I was like, oh, I know how to make toast. Dang it, right, I'm a terrible cook. And uh, I said, food, are you serious? And it was cool. So he, he, they would divide us all up. And the, the rules were none of the professors could interact with you unless you asked them a question. So they, they could not come at all during the semester and come say, here's what I would do. Okay? They wanted you to think and to come up with questions, come up with what we should be focusing on, and focus on your problem-solving skills as much as your actual business creation skills. So... At that time, I was already trying to do a whole bunch of businessy things, and all the other students knew that, so they voted me in as the CEO of this little food business. And I was like, I don't know how to make, like, I'm terrible at cooking. <laughs> so uh, I was not excited. One day, though, he walks into this class, and they broke us down into, like, 15-person businesses. Uh, sorry, 15, yeah, 15 people in our business, okay? And... Um, he walks on in, and he was the advisor over this one and for us to see if we have any questions. And we walk on into the class one day, and we walk on in, and across the tables all over the place was Play-Doh and Silly String and Legos and Connects. And the rule was, in order to be in the room, you had to continue to play and fidget the whole time. And if you stopped, you got kicked out. And we're like, what? This is ridiculous. This is like a hot upper level marketing class, right? So we sit in there. We had just come out of quantitative marketing research, all these stats and all this crap, and I hate it. Blah, it's terrible. And then we go into this, and we're like playing with toys. I mean, literally, they were toys. They're kid toys. And, um, and he said, something that was very offensive to me at the time, I'm going to teach you how to think. <laughs> and we're like, okay. <laughs> And he goes, I'm going to teach you how to think. And what he did is he said, I want you all today, the only thing you're going to do is come up with your business name. That's it. Very simple. Who's going to be the scribe? So he, has, he chooses someone. Someone stands on up. Um, I was the acting CEO. You know, so he's, he's like, he asked me to choose somebody. They, I had them come stand on up. And he said, now the only issue here, the only, the only directive is that anything that anyone says, you cannot, cannot even have a negative body reaction. You can't go, you can't go, you can't go, or I will spray you in the water with face. Uh, I'll spray you in the face with water, sorry. And, and he yelled, bad kitty. So he would stand up, and I remember the first time some kid said, what about this? And he goes and he uh, uh, starts writing it on the board, and some kid in the class was like, stupid idea. And he stands up and he goes, bad kitty! And he sprays water in the face of this kid. And we're all like, what the freak? Like, this is weird, you know? And this guy, though, was one of the most brilliant creative people I've ever met in my entire life. And it's the principal, he stood up, the, uh, sorry, the, the principal of this whole thing was that if you are negative at all in your life, if you are negative Nancy, if you are not playful, you will not be creative. You can't be. The more playful individuals are more creative people. You see them all bouncy and light, and I like dancing to my own music that I chose. <laughs> That's part of the thing. That's part of the state control. And <clears throat> what he did, though, is he had us come on in and started teaching us a creative 
um, thinking process. And uh, it was one of the most impactful things ever. And what I started realizing is that a lot of the things that I've been doing all along the last few years has come from this. And I didn't know that, okay? It's called design thinking. This is not my term, this is actually what it's called. Okay, design thinking is a process to help you go in and um, manufacture creativity, even if you feel like you're not creative. Very powerful. Has anyone ever heard of a company called IDEO? Yeah, okay, this comes from IDEO. IDEO, if you don't know who they are, they're the ones that invented the mouse. They invented the handle of the toothbrush. They um, came up with the way a lot of like rocket fuselages are, right? And you listen to these guys, they're like, we don't know anything about that stuff. <laughs> but we have a process that manufactures creativity to solve problems. So that's what we're gonna do with you. And we're gonna go through that process together, okay? I'm gonna teach you how to think, <laughs> okay? And so I have a lot of people who will come up and they ask like, how do you come up with these things? I'm just following the process, okay? And it's like a four or five step process that people have um, proven out. I mean, so when Steve Jobs needed to create a mouse for the first personal computer, these are the guys that did it. It's from them, it's been around a long time now, and um, they, they do all kinds of things, okay? So, <clears throat> like I said, I've used part of IDEO's process in my offer creation stuff from the beginning, and I didn't really realize that. And there's a few key pieces and things that he taught me about how to think and how to be creative, how to come up with stuff that's nuts, okay, um, to make successful offers and come up with stuff that is truly blue and unique and things like that. Make sense? Yeah. I want you guys to know a little bit more about this process, so we're actually gonna watch a little, quick little video here of them, okay? This is from the IDEO. That is the most complicated question. What is IDEO? Uh, IDEO. 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 IDEO looks like a very serious design company. Behind the scenes, it's kind of like Oompa Loompa, Willy Wonka, <laughs> Playland. There is this amazing power of wide-eyed curiosity. What is it that the world needs or that person needs? It's hard to imagine a facet of life where we're not being asked some kind of interesting question. How might government be more responsive to its citizens? What is teaching and learning in the 21st century? How do we think about accessibility? Make healthcare more seamless. Design the future of self-driving experiences. Change the demographic for voting in a county that has five million voters speaking 30 different languages. Provide access to justice to all the people who can't afford lawyers. Create products that actually add value to people's lives rather than becoming another distraction. IDEO is uniquely equipped to come into those kinds of big, messy, complex problems. I think we're teeter-tottering on the edge of really getting into some great shit. David, interview, take two. There's a lot of Davids in this company, just so you know. After I met Bill, we decided to merge our firms and make IDEO. That was a long time ago. So before we merged, the designers would come up with some beautiful stuff, and the engineers would want to compromise all the interesting bits away to make it more manufacturable. Turns out it was actually a big idea for us to come up with something that was well-designed and well-engineered, and then present that to the client. See their eyes sparkle. That's when we knew we really had something of consequence. At IDEO, there was a different approach. It was designers and engineers working together. We would go in to see the CEO, and he or she would say, you know, you say you want to design our new chair, let's say. Tell us about other chairs you've designed, right? And um, I didn't have the heart to tell them that not only hadn't we designed any chairs, we hadn't designed anything. but. We have this process that'll probably result in a different kind of chair than if you hired a chair designer to do it. That was the pitch. I had a background in psychology. Gosh, it seems like we know or should be learning quite a lot about people. Couldn't we therefore be designing better stuff? if we incorporated some of that knowledge into some of the decisions that we were making. Common sense would say, well, instead of just designing it by yourself in a room with a bunch of other engineers, maybe you should go out and talk to people that you're designing for. You know, from business school and every quarter of any institution I'd ever worked for, there's a real premium on knowing. And people would actually carry around books of what they know. And at IDEO, it was just okay to say, I don't know, let's find out. It's our job to always question everything and always ask why. Why is that? Why do you do that? We go out into the world, we talk to people, we sit in their homes, we have conversations with people, we ask for their ideas. 
we would come back from the field informed and inspired by some of the things we'd seen. We can use our tools and education and expertise and intuition to create a solution for you. Because people would say, oh, I'm stupid. I can't figure out how to use this thing. We said, no, 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 no. It's poorly designed. We'll make it so that it's intuitive. And then you don't have to have this disconnect between the human and the technology part. Designing a reading machine for blind people or computers that were going to figure out whether this was a tissue match between two people getting a heart transplant. I mean, that's the kind of stuff we're working on. Design a mouse or design a laptop. What's that? I mean, we get to determine what this thing is from scratch. There's an inquisitive approach that doesn't say, what do I as a creative person want to put out into the world? What does the world need? What's the world asking of us? And then how can we use design to help bring that to life? The culture of how you go about innovation and design is as important as the process. Design for me has never been an individual sport, it's always been a team sport. How could I possibly have all the good ideas? What we found is that when we brought these people in from different disciplines, they just had ideas that resonated. People coming together with different areas of expertise. Fluidly working together and provoking each other to do a little bit better. Constantly entertaining ourselves by adding new disciplines to the mix and activating them as designers. Musicians jam together. You walk into a project space, it's you know the same kind of energy. The Nightline shopping cart video in 1999 still amazes me. The number of people that come up to me and say, oh, I saw it in my class. You saw it in your business school class in 1999? No, no, last week. Take something old and familiar, like say the shopping cart, and completely redesign it for us in just five days. Humble object, really, a shopping cart that everybody could relate to. It was long enough to show how we actually behave together and how individuals contributed and how the group worked. Oh, you know, that's what happens. Everything gets designed and there are people who do that and that looks exciting. It seemed to be an example of how you could be more effective as innovators. So I think that was actually the most important thing. There was nothing in that show that said, you need design. People filled in that space. We got a call from the director of the emergency room at DePaul who said, if you can do that for the shopping cart, you can do that for my emergency room. And so we did. This was a surprise to us in terms of how far it could go, and it really unlocked the diversification that we saw with the rise of design. Once we'd stepped over that line and we were comfortable with that, we just kept going. All of a sudden, businesses that had been happy, kind of trundling along for decades, found themselves having to innovate. So there was this recognition that the world of business really wasn't equipped to grow in this way and that the smart organizations would cultivate that and invest in it. Help me get better at creating more options for my customers so that I can grow the top line of my company. Design thinking gave us a way of explaining what design was to people who didn't understand it. It's actually not anything IDEO invented. The only thing that we did was try to make it a bit more explicit. Here's how we understand the market and the people. Here's how we interview people to understand what they'd like. And here's how we prototype. It empowers people to get their ideas out and to share them. It's just a way to start. Being willing to have 100 sketches on the floor that didn't work before you find the one that does. We test those out, we see what works, and we refine those. From ambiguity to clarity to refinement to either launch or implementation. It holds the space for us to be sort of ambiguous and messy, knowing that you're moving in a certain direction that's going to lead to the outcomes you're looking for. Creating the conditions for innovation to happen over and over again. By having a methodology that we could teach, that we could share, where we could have clients come and work with us in the project room instead of just waiting for us to turn up with the deliverables, it made it possible for them to begin to soak up that capability. It doesn't just sit within IDEO. This is something that we've actually brought to a lot of our client partners and then helped them grow within their own organization. It's good for business to let creativity out of the cage and let it run down the corridors. All we've done over the years is figured out how to scale it, how to make it more accessible by embracing design thinking we were able to start to find ourselves in those types of conversations that were far more impactful for society. The world is at a difficult place right now. 
If you look at communication, politics, society, the environment, there's a fundamental or an inherent lack of creativity in trying to answer these questions. In a moment where there's so much disruption and upheaval, being able to sit in that space and guide others through the ambiguity is incredibly valuable. Not trying to know the answer at the start of the process is something that is very fundamental to design. We bring our creative lens, imagining how we can make that world better. I'm careful about words like solution or the answer because these are people-based systems. The important part about tackling big questions like that is trying to understand the context in which they sit. It's not just about going to someone's house and spending an hour anymore. The best way to do that is to start with co-design instead of going to those people to learn from them, actually bringing them in to the process. Not just clients and organizations we're designing for, but the people that it's going to affect and communities, governments, organizations and partners that can help us implement. The larger the scale gets, the easier it is to forget about the people in the system. The people in that community are shaping the decisions that they're making. So we had to shift away from being the ones to decide to being the ones who facilitated others to get to that decision so that their voice is the design solution. That's the only way you can go after these big, complex problems. We have helped elevate design up to being one of the ways in which humanity improves itself and improves its condition. We've had a series of these clients over the years that have helped expand our minds. Carlos Rodriguez Pastor, who's the CEO of Intercorp, he came and said, I want to redesign schools in Peru and I think you can help. We would have loved to have thought that we could design a new school system, but I'm not sure we would have ever gone to somebody and say, hey, please let us. Idea is going to go where people ask us. The problems we're being asked to help solve are far beyond what we could have imagined four decades ago. If the whole world thinks all designers do is something decorative, they're not going to come to you and say, hey, we actually have a serious issue of sexual harassment on our university campus. Can design play a part in helping us solve that? And not through just putting up more compliance posters, but actually asking, how do people relate to each other? What is the culture? What should be changed? Design can help answer that. Today, we're thinking about design as an opportunity to reimagine the world, the objects, the institutions that help to reinforce the ways that people relate to each other. Redesigning entire systems that affect our societies. How do we design a system of re-entry for people who have been incarcerated? Make saving money more fun. Help make Judaism fit into people's lives. Help successful companies of the past be thriving companies of the future. Redesign our idea of classic beauty. Create a welcoming and secure environment for immigrants. To a certain extent, the first response has to be, where do we start? If it was that easy, somebody else would have done it. Literally, the hairs will stand up on the back of my neck when I know we're at the edge of everybody's ability. You're on a lake, and the fog drops down, and you are rowing, and the client is freaking out because you know you're going to hit land, but the client thinks, oh my god, they're rowing us into the middle of oblivion. We're in the business of sort of navigating the fog and helping clients not jump out of the boat. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. What is the difference <clears throat> between a marketer and an entrepreneur? I hear mumbles. Questions by revelation. Let's do. What's that? Okay, makes you an entrepreneur. What else? Entrepreneurs solve problems. Marketers sell. Always maker. 100% straight on, right there. A marketer brings a product to market. An entrepreneur is just a problem solver. So, anyone ever had this experience? Like, I, I was like, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. So I went and I like put it on Facebook like forever ago, years ago. And I had a guy, a buddy, reach out to me, and he was kind of making fun of me. And he goes, Oh yeah, what did you entrepreneur? And I was like, that's a, good, that's a good question. What have I created? And so I like, tried to save face and said something weird. But his, his idea was correct, though. right? He's like, what did you entrepreneur? An entrepreneur is a problem sol solver. A marketer is just somebody who brings the solution to the market right? and, and uh, how they sell and interact with the, those people there. Um, so 
I'm really psyched by this because I want you guys to see this part of it. This, this has been one of the biggest, I do this, out, that's why I take those yellow pieces of paper and I lay problems all out on my floor. Have you guys seen me do that on my Instagram? So that's why I'm doing that, is I start working through the problem. I did that for this, right? And I'm thinking through like, what's the issue? How can we go through and solve that? And I go, allow my head to go to the crazy zone. So this is the design thinking process. This is IDEO's process itself. So first what we're gonna do is we're going to empathize with the person that we're trying to solve a problem for which is why we started the who. We always started the who, right? So we're gonna go and we're gonna, uh, uh, actually I'm walking through it here, but this is, a, a, like I said, a process for creative problem solving. It's human-centered design and it helps navigate the fog because what do I create and what do I bring to the marketplace can be a very challenging question. So again, we empathize. We're gonna go and we're going to understand our who very, very deeply. Next, we're gonna define. Define's the next step, meaning we're gonna get data. So I'm gonna go in and that's what, that's what Noah Keegan was telling me. He's like, hey, I let people vote with their wallets, not their mouths, right? I'm gonna go get data, I'm gonna talk with people, I'm gonna share my ideas back and forth. Ideate means to just carry tons of ideas and this is the part that my professor was yelling bad kitty at that guy. All ideas are fine. In fact, the crazier the design, the better. I'll share that in a moment. Then we're gonna make a prototype and then we test it and we don't test it against ourselves. I'm not the one buying it. We test it in front of those who are actually going to be using it then it's actually a big, we just, we iterate between ID8 prototype test, ID8 prototype test, ID8 prototype test. It's those three things over and over and over again that improve your solution, okay? This is, what, this is what we do, this is what we do as marketers. In fact, a lot of strategies we teach on how to bring something to market, it's just different variations of this, okay? So um, it's so important to be in a group when you guys do this stuff. Anyone ever heard of this book, Strategic Product Creation? I have um, my bookshelves, I categorize them. <laughs> so I have a offer creation section. <laughs> just tons of books on strategic offer creation. I have another section that's just all about scaling and business systems. Another one all about traffic. And it's like, oh, anyway, this is one of my books on there. It says, groups tend to generate more creative ideas than individuals working in isolation, especially when group members have widely varying experiences, capabilities, and perspectives. Absolutely love this. So what we'll go do, and uh, I do this with my team now, um, we'll think through a problem, we're like, hey, this is the problem we're gonna go solve, and then I go kind of the crazy zone, and then I'll present it to them, and I ask them to, so I would call it black hat. White hat, come up with uh, ideas, black hat, poke holes. we are like, all right, let's black hat, all right? And then Austin and Colton, they'll be like, hole, 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 that was dumb, that was dumb, that was dumb, let me be the, like, you know what I mean? And, you can't get married to your thing. It's broken, always. And they start writing out tons of issues and we go back and forth and I start thinking through what's wrong with what I just created. Now we go back to the drawing board and we iterate. We go back to ideate, recreate the prototype and go back to test. And if as long as it starts to pass us, then I know I'll start bringing it to you guys. But it's gone through, that's why Offermine, you guys like Offermine? <laughs> that took forever, okay? And it's because of this process though I do it for the content I produce. I do it for the products we create. We do it for the messages, every interaction. I've had a few people tell me, why do you create, why do you prepare so, I bet you could just go on stage and riff for days. I, I would never do that <laughs> because this is my sport, first of all, right? I would never walk onto a stage unprepared. I would never say a message into a marketplace without having gone through this process. And this is, this is how we do it, okay? You gotta go to the crazy zone. Got to go to the crazy zone. Um, I love this example. 1960s, Pentagon had a vision for an invisible aircraft. It can't be possible, though. But honestly, they pursued it. And that's what invented stealth aircraft, okay? It was their idea of this process, thinking through, like, what if we had invisible aircraft? And this is, this is, how, this is how it came about. Um, Got to go to the crazy zone. I remember, uh, this is actually what we used to do, uh, Russell and I, when we start coming up with his offers, um, when I was still over there. And... <clears throat> In fact, the first two comic book coaching program, that evening we're sitting on stage and he was like, I'm not gonna do this any less than 18 grand. And then we started coming up with the offer and we go to the nuts zone. And he was like, what if we, oh my gosh, what if they came to my house and slept in my pajamas? Oh, oh yeah, sounds good, that's gonna be awesome. <laughs> oh man, what if they like, the hypers would love to brush their teeth with my toothbrush. Oh my gosh, that's gonna be so cool. <laughs> right, my wife will make them breakfast. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Maybe plus we'll give them some personalized coaching. Okay, sounds good too. Maybe we'll help them build their funnels. Oh, sounds good. And then we go back and we cross off the ludicrous. <laughs> All right, I'm not gonna brush teeth, it's really gross. Okay. 
We have to understand that it's the nuts ideas that influence the mundane to become prolific. Have to have that. Have to have that. And the biggest issue is adults that think this is stupid or childish or the fact that it's Play-Doh. Get over it, okay? <laughs> Go to the crazy zone. Come back and say, well, how can this nuts idea, invisibility, influence aircraft? And that's how stealth aircraft came about. Okay, there's a lot of, a lot of stories like this. Okay, so feel free to go to the crazy zone with this. Um, I wrote a, a, a paper in, in college called Product Evolution versus Product Big Bang Theory. Okay, we tend to think as entrepreneurs more that it's like Product Big Bang Theory, meaning premonition, oh my gosh, right? Mark, Zucker Mark Zuckerberg just like poops out Facebook. <laughs> Doesn't work like that. It's more, it works more like product evolution. I'm gonna come up with a solution and I'm gonna make it a little bit better, a little bit better, a little better. If ClickFunnels was still trying to fix every little tiny, like minuscule bug, it still wouldn't be launched, right? It's about product evolution. Way, way better than product big bang theory. So like some of the questions you guys are asking about how do I know this, how do I know that, you'll find out when you get there. You'll find out when you get there, just launch. You're not the one buying it, you gotta test it in order to know how to move, right? Uh, again, oh, this is that article. Uh, Time Magazine basically found out that creativity has nothing to do with intelligence. Super good, super good issue. Okay, so we're gonna do this. Sound good? Okay, yes. so the idea here is that now that you know your who, you know the market, you know how you're positioned against it, you are looking back at the who, at the issues they're having, you've chosen one problem. With that one problem in mind, we're gonna do this process to help you create your core product, not offer product, okay? So we're gonna go through this whole thing and uh, we have several tools here for you. Sounds good? It's gonna be delicious nutrition. All right, here we go.